Well, good afternoon, Dr. Phil Manning. This is a privilege to be here to interview you. You're my teacher, and I'm still one of your students. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so I will have many questions to ask, and I'm sure you'll have some wonderful answers. So when did you become interested in and associated with USC? Well, I don't know I'd quite say associated, but I became involved with USC in 1927 when my father started taking me to a USC football games. And I have vivid memories of some of the earlier players, Francis Tappan and uh, uh, the one was Orb Moeller and Gus Shaver. The one that was my favorite was Cotton Warburton with 156-pound All-American blonde hair. Occasionally his helmet would get knocked off and you'd see this blonde, blonde kid running around, <laughs> with, uh, uh, around these big bruisers. Uh, so that was, uh, was uh, really fun. And you could see... Uh, you could see Coach Jones at that time. They were dressed in a suit with a fedora hat, uh, and uh, everything was very, uh, very uh, uh, subdued in a sense. And the rooting section made a big point of nobody boos, which is not true anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, it isn't. So do you remember anything else about the game specifically? Well, maybe not so much about the game, but I do remember that uh, uh, von Kleinschmidt, who was uh, just coming in, I think, as president at that time, would come around in an open, uh, open limousine and wave to the crowd. They had to track at that time, and he would, uh, he would take the, the proper bows, and the rooting section would all cheer when he got out of the car to <laughs> go into the stands. Well, that's quite an so. entry. <laughs> yeah, I remember Dr. von Kleinschmidt, because he was still dean when, when, you, when I came right. down. So. <laughs> When did you enter USC as a student? As a student, um, well, you know, I, I, uh, I guess that would be 1940 when I came uh, came uh, in as a as a freshman. That's an undergrad. Uh, undergrad, yes. right? Undergrad, and uh, it was I lived on Wilton Place, so it was not a long drive. We lived at home most of us at that time, unless we were in a fraternity or sorority, and so uh, it was convenient and. Uh, that's where I came. I started out. So 1940. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, how different were things then for you and the other students? Well, you know, the first of all, the facilities are maybe maybe not the deepest thing, but the facilities were totally different. I remember one class in what they called uh, Old College, which is where Founders is now, and the plaster would fall down on you during <laughs> during, uh, during the day. The parking lot. Uh, was, which is where the uh, McCarthy Square is now. And um, many people who were fortunate enough to have a car, and fortunately I did have one, used the car as a locker and kept it unlocked. And nothing, there was never any problem with anything being stolen. I did come back once after the war and left the car unlocked, and what it was ever in, it was gone. But uh, in those That's days, different. <laughs> in those days, it was, it was okay. The, um, yeah, at any rate, that was the facility would would be the most obvious thing. There probably were other details that were different. And then locking your car, what were some of the other things uh, that the students have changed from then to now? Well, certainly the dress has changed. Whether the motivation has changed, I, I, I don't know. People say the current group are more uh, uh, motivated. Maybe they are. Uh, but uh, you, you go to most campuses, uh, even Stanford and Cal and all, and the people look like vagrants. They're you know, sort of dressed. Dressed in the sloppily, you see it we, on the news, yeah. we had to wear uh, a sports jacket, and the ladies, all the young young girls, uh, students, all had uh, hairdos that were were nicely done and all. So they things looked a little different. Uh, I think really, I think the people were pretty well motivated then, uh, and especially as the war years came along, then the motivation got very high. Cause Was the, the tuition high then? Uh, Sixteen bucks a unit. Wow. That's not too high well, compared no, to today. Not to today, no. <laughs> uh, who are some of the faculty that you remember in your undergraduate? Well, you know, the, I got started right off the bat with an exciting course uh, called Man and Civilization by Wallbank and Taylor. And uh, they wrote the book, and I think many of the colleges used that book. We used it a And that, that <laughs> it did it well there. That's an that's a honor. Uh, so this was a, a terrific uh, opportunity to get an idea of what the world was like. And that influenced me as much as almost any program I've had. Um, and I must confess uh, to, to this day, uh, what I main, mainly like reading is, is historical things. My son and daughter have picked that up as well, and that's what they like to do. In addition to that, uh, Lee Travis was an outstanding uh, 
uh, teacher and it, it helped me understand uh, psychology uh, to a little better extent. And then we had a really super astronomer named Clemenceau. And uh, he, um, he opened up what the skies were like. And so I would think those three people, uh, uh, not counting the, uh, the pre-med courses, I would think they probably had the most influence. Yeah, well, the pre-med courses were basic science. And how did they compare with what you know of today? Well, I think, um, I think the, what we used to call zoology, which would now be sort of general biology, I think that was, pr was pretty good. We ha I had Catherine Beers for that. Uh, for the general course, and, uh, and uh, Professor Harrison was embryology and comparative anatomy. Uh, Dr. Beers uh, appointed me uh, as a, uh, a teaching assistant the, the year after I finished the course, and I, I, I had the uh, remarkable salary of 40 cents an hour. But it was, it was a really good experience. Of course, you would buy a lot more then. You could buy a lot more then, that's true. So uh, how many years did you spend in your pre-med preparation? Uh, you know, I started off, the first semester was in economics. My dad was in business, and he thought that would be a good background. And it was clear to me I didn't really like that so much. And, and, uh, and I was beginning to think, yeah, it, what I really wanted to do was to get into medicine. I look, look back on my John Burroughs Junior High uh, book, uh, yearbook, and it said what I wanted to do was to be a doctor. I don't remember telling him that, but that's what it says in print. Well, good for you. <laughs> so you knew Ernie. <laughs> well, apparently so, apparently so. Uh, and part, part of that, I suppose, came about because of good experiences with our family doctor, Dr. Herbert Anderson, who when I, my mother was a little bit of a hypochondriac, so I get a little sniffle, and she would call him, <laughs> he'd come by on his way back from, uh, from uh, his office and say, no, he's going to be all right. <laughs> but he uh, treated as well, and I think that probably had something to do with it. Well, good. And so when did you enter the medical school? Um, Medical school was, um, you know, I almost didn't go to SC. Um, I, um, I was accepted at Columbia, uh, Cornell, Duke, Boston, a couple of other schools on the East Coast. And actually, I had decided to go to uh, Columbia, uh, which seemed to be a bit more prestigious at that time. Uh, however, the, the circumstance that made me change my mind was that uh, uh, the wartime had started by then, and uh, this, uh, SC's class started almost at once in the spring, and Columbia was in the fall. And I thought, grab a, a bird in the hands, it's worth two in the bush. And so I did that, and the fact is, it was a blessing. I never regretted half a minute for, uh, for going to SC. I thought it, it was the best I don't the know any one of us students uh, that have felt different from that. It's yeah. been a blessing, and yeah. truly. Yeah. Uh, can you tell me about your years in medical school? When did you first start seeing patients? I know you had well, basic classes. We did have good basic science, too, as a matter of fact. We were on campus then. It was split. The campus we're was down here in uh, on University Park, and then the, the last couple of years were, on, uh, were over at County Hospital. But um, we had, uh, for example, we had Harry Duell and, and, and uh, uh, John Mell, were, and a man named Winslow, I've forgotten his first name, went back to become head of the department at the uh, University of Indiana in biochemistry, and they, they were really very, very good. Um, uh, um, you, you were mentioning a little earlier about remembering Dr. Paddock, and he was our anatomy teacher, and in our day, anatomy took almost the entire year. It was an amazing amount of, uh, and that's been clearly de-emphasized uh, lately. One of the best uh, uh, instructors in that early part was um, was uh, uh, Gardner, Ernie Gardner, who went back to become dean of one of the mm -hmm. Midwestern schools after that. But he, he really taught neuroanatomy and was great. We had an interesting uh, professor, Drury, who was many people thought was virtually of Nobel quality he, for his lab Wasn't work. He in lung pathology? Uh, I thought he did more hypertension and things okay. of that sort at that time. Mm -hmm. I don't, was he one of your... Uh, he was one of our instructors, One sure. of your instructors. Well, you remember, he was not a good lecturer. Yeah, but what he did, <laughs> we used to use Best and Taylor, which was an enormous uh, physiology book, and he pared that down to about 100 pages. It was beautifully done, but his, his lectures were left a little to be desired. I remember one time he would write on the board in all sorts of different directions, and you'd see this <laughs> mass of chalk on the board. And one time when somebody asked him a question, a follow-up question, 
And he looked back and he said, right there, and pointed to this mess on the board. <laughs> and that was supposedly the answer. <laughs> John, uh, John um, Webb was a superb lecturer in, um, in pharmacology. So I think, I really think we had a, as good a basic science as anybody did at that time. Well, when did you get to start seeing patients and well, observe patients? Well, that was the second year in, of, the, of the second part, the second semester of the second year. And uh, where we began to have physical diagnosis, which was handled a little differently then, and I think quite well. What we did, we went from specialty to specialty. Uh, so Howard House taught us uh, ENT and uh, various other people. Griffith, taught was he still there? George was uh, was just coming in. Actually, mm -hmm. he had just uh, come in from doing other activities. But he, yes, George was was certainly one of our our, uh, our major mentors, and he he did a very good job. Um, the um, another thing that was interesting, they had a, 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 a Barclay Noble had a program on how to practice, and he actually had organized his practice that would would be spit and polished today. It was just great. He told us how to take histories and and how to do the various other aspects, what 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 was necessary in practice, and then finally we ended up on the ward and tried to pull all this stuff together. And I had uh, Maury Lipkus, uh, uh, who was uh, uh, the, um, the uh, t teacher of, of physical diagnosis. And we began to think, you know, maybe we're going to be doctors here after all. <laughs> so that was in your second year. And that, third year, what was that consistent of? Third year was obviously mostly clerkships. And uh, we had, uh, I remember, I think, mostly about the, uh, the medical clerkships. The uh, residents. Uh, were senior, r good residents, because many of them had had a couple of three years in the service. And so they were mature doctors, but they did most of the teaching. We did not see, in those days, much in the way of, of faculty huh. that was on in the, the wards. Yeah, well, now was that before the war ended or after? This was, uh, by the time we got to the third year, the war was, was essentially over and the, and the residents were returning. Okay. Or the, or the people that were in the services and they decided we want to be specialists because the specialists got better deals than the service. Which of the specialties that you went through your clerkships with stood out the most to you? Well, I, I would have to, I, obviously I was sort of always inclined toward medicine and I, I liked that particularly well. I was, I was, had good experiences there. And we, we had, um, you know, those wards were crowded then. And uh, big virtu hospital. virtually no nurses. And if you'd come on at night, th there would be a, a, a student, a, a one of the gra not a graduate, but an actual student nurse between two of the wing wards. So she was looking after 80 patients, if you can imagine. So that it was a really crowded thing. And in, in, in the early days there, when uh, in the county hospital you could see anybody, uh, there were pe the people moved out from the east and the, and the Midwest to be. In, in the defense industry, and so we had what would be normally private patients that would, you could easily see. Well, did you have to present cases to uh, faculty and residents? You know, we uh, don't, didn't do as much of that. T to the residents, yes, uh -huh. we would we would make some presentations, but not the formal bedside presentations that I think you made to Dr. Brem uh, yes. later on. <laughs> right, I remember right. them well. <laughs> uh, when, so you entered your clerkships in the third year. Third year, right. And uh, in the fourth year, what courses were different by the fourth well, year? Well, you know, there was another course that started in the third year. It was called Survey of Disease. I can't remember whether that was still in existence. I think maybe it we was had, it I was don't there. remember which year they gave it yeah. to us. But and yeah. Helen Martin, uh, uh, Ralph Homan, and Hugh Edmondson taught this course. And what it did, what they tried to do, and most successfully, was to um, take the stuff that we learned or should have learned in basic science and tried to link it with the clinical experience. And then that was really a, really coming together with things. And as, as we got on the ward, this, this, this program seemed particularly good. So you had your clinical experience then at uh, big Los Angeles County Most Hospital. Most of it. Most How of many it. beds were there then? I'm going to exaggerate a little bit, but there were over 3,000. And I, 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 I've heard a little slightly different numbers, but I think that is pretty close to true. Yeah, that puts it about the third largest in the whole United States. Didn't it? Under one roof, it was supposedly the largest. Yeah. Was it? Yeah. I didn't. Wow. Yeah. So uh, aside from L.A. County Hospital, 
Did you go to other hospitals during your student years? Well, yes, yes, I did. First of all, I uh, was fortunate enough to get a job uh, externing, where I do history and physicals, first in the Methodist Hospital, then the Good Samaritan Hospital. That was in your fourth year? Uh, latter part of the third and, and the, all the fourth, yes. Mm -hmm. And the uh, they, uh, Good Samaritan paid seven bucks uh, for that evening, but the, the, uh, again, I, it was a you know a nicely organized hospital, and it was a, a somewhat different group of patients. So I experienced that. Vern Mason, who uh, was Howard Hughes's doctor, was one of the uh, doctors that whose patients I would work up. And I do recall when Howard Hughes had his plane crash, they took over one of the floors for him, and the whole hospital became almost in a turmoil to look after Mr. Hughes. Uh, uh, Johnny Jones was our, our, uh, our, our uh, chest surgeon and Vern Mason, our internist, they looked after him. Well, that made him interested in the USC medicine, didn't it? Well, not enough. We'd like to see more, <laughs> more come his way, come our way. The, uh, the fourth year we saw, we went to the Children's Hospital. And uh, that was a really an interesting experience. That was the closest thing we had come to a, as a university hospital. Dr. Professor Little who had come from Columbia, uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Getch were really good, and they took us hand in hand and, and, uh, and really t took very good care of us. It was good teaching. Dr. Little was kind of an amusing man. He was serious, so I wouldn't, maybe, maybe he wouldn't like that word, amusing, but he was hard of hearing. And we'd go to grand, the students would sit in the back in grand rounds. But you'd notice if one of the grand round presenters was talking too loud, he would pull the plug out of his, <laughs> his hearing aid. So <laughs> the, the guy would get the point pretty much that maybe you've done enough here. <laughs> Where did you take your internship? I, L.A. County. And that was, uh, that was uh, very tough, uh, physically tough. Uh, the, the one that I remember the most was uh, uh, orthopedics and there was one day a month or one day and a half a month where you were on actually 36 straight hours you s there was one day I think and I may have this uh, sequence a little out of it you we we were on sort of general ward work and then we were on emergency admitting at that night and then daytime admitting uh, the next day and then at four o'clock if you can imagine we went to the low back clinic and these poor souls with painful backs were meeting a sleepy group of doctors, I guarantee Well, I was going to say, <laughs> they had low back, you had sleeplessness. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> but it was, a, it was a, good, a good experience, and it, uh, uh, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't want to miss it. I don't know that I'd want to do it every day of my life, but it was a, it was a good experience. Well, how did the Warriors affect your medical uh, education years? You know, uh, we were lucky. We were we were on the gravy train. People, our my colleagues were getting killed on the front lines, or, or I had a few aviator friends that were shot down, so we were pretty lucky. Uh, we we most of us lived at home. There was no dorm at SC. Um, we drilled each morning. The, there was the, there was an army group <coughs> and a navy group. The army group drilled for five days a week for a half hour or something like that in the morning. So you students were in uh, reserves. Uh, well, we were actually on active duty, oh. but uh, it was called ASTP, Army Arnold's Ar Army Specialized Training Program, and then the Navy V12 had uh, had their group. Wow. <laughs> well, how did. Uh how did this affect the medical faculty? Did many of them go to war, and which ones do you remember the best? Well, you know, they did. They did. And one queen rose out of, the, out of all this was Helen Martin. Yeah. And Helen uh, had uh, polio as a young child and was quite handicapped. But this woman was, I guess, as smart a person as I've ever met, and as determined in what way and determined that Every student, every intern, every resident, even every attending man, give their level best to the patients on the on the wards of the county hospital. And she had an influence over the whole whole hospital. Ran, I think, one of the finest diabetic wards ever. And she would that poor soul. Uh, she wanted to be called day or night. She spent all day there, but wanted to be called day or night any time a, a, a diabetic coma would come in. And so she was virtually 24 hours a day for 
two or three years while everybody was away. Well, I surely remember Helen Martin, and she started a chorus. Why don't you tell us about the Kuth chorus that uh, Oh, she yes, started. she did. She did. Well, she got the, she, actually, she was, had broad interest. That's true. I mean, I, I, I emphasize what her determination in medicine was, and she, she, she really was determined. But she did feel that medical students perhaps were not getting enough of the humanities. And so she uh, went to the committee and, uh, uh, and finally got it approved that they would um, uh, have programs at noon where we'd come in with brown bags and eat lunch in, the, in one of the auditoriums at the county hospital uh, and um, hear a lecture generally on s from some English professor or some historian or some ethicist. And I, th I, th I think those work pretty well. That came after I graduated, probably more during your time. And I remember it very well, and, and it was attended by students, uh, by everyone. Interns and residents, and a few staff turnouts. would come out. Right, right. So when were you involved with a survey of diseases? Is that, did that come now during the residency? No, no, that now we're, we're, we're getting me into the faculty. And uh, I well, had- Did you take your residency at County? No. I was at the VA hospital, which is, was in Van Nuys in a place called Birmingham that later moved to what is now the VA in Long Beach. And uh, that again was a blessing because I met Tom Brim at that point and he became my mentor and my benefactor and the person that hired in me. In internal medicine. In internal medicine, absolutely. Yeah. So that was good. And in those days, it was a busy service. The, uh, the war was just about over, and a lot of veterans were coming in with almost anybody was considered as an OK patient then. And um, so I, uh, I had a, a good period of time then. How then long were you there at Birmingham? I, a, little, a, a little over two years. And, and then, then I went. Did you go somewhere else? I did. I then went to the Mayo Clinic and in, in a fellowship in internal medicine. Mm -hmm. And there I learned how a practice plan ought to, ought to be. And because that was the finest organization, I think it still is, in terms of delivering care. Did you do any specializing? I mean, did you have a special interest at, while you were at Mayo? Um, yeah, I, I suppose my interest has always leaned toward cardiology, but I, I've always more or less thought of myself as a, as a generalist with an interest in, uh, in cardiology. But we had terrific uh, conferences at noon, again, with Brown Baggett and uh, Jess Edwards, uh, uh, Howard Birchall and Ray Pruitt would uh, go over, and, and Woods, who was the physiologist, would go over cases, and so I learned quite a little bit there. Then you came back. Well, no, then I went. Then I spent during the Korean War. I spent two oh. years in the Air Force at Chinoot Air Base in, in Illinois, and uh, was was a assistant chief of uh, medicine, and was uh, fundamentally taking care of patients on the ward and in the outpatient. Were you Another called good experience. a flight surgeon? I didn't, I didn't go to flight school. No, I didn't. Okay. Right. But it was a good experience. It was in again. the Air Force. Yeah. Is it then that you came back to USC? Then in 1954, I, I came out to, uh, to L.A. Uh, to look for a job. And I went out and talked to Johnny Lawrence at UCLA. And then I learned somehow that Tom Brim, who was, who was at the VA, was going to become medical head at uh, USC. And uh, so I kind of broke off that, and uh, I called uh, Tom, and I said, uh, you know, I'm available. <laughs> and he and Gordon Goodhart um, were able to put together a job where they got, I, I got $2,000 for organizing or, or at least supervising the outpatient, which was a fairly large service for students, not for interns and residents, with Jim Cummins, who had come in from, uh, from Harvard and 2500 to be ward instructor on the seventh floor. Um, so uh, I thought that was great. We, we moved into Whittier. I commuted 16 miles uh, a day and uh, had a really good start uh, and, and was very happy that I was at SC again. You know, that's when I first remember you. Our class started <laughs> in 54, yeah. and you were one of the first instructors that we had in, in uh, physical medicine and in physical diagnosis, and uh, I remember you well then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so tell me about some of the uh, uh, faculty you worked with early at USC. Well, I'd, I had a chance to work with a, a lot of different people in different capacities. I, as I say, I started off as ward instructor, 
uh, I did do physical diagnosis. I was also supervising with Jim Cummins, the, uh, the outpatient, and then Helen Martin and Pete Reynolds at that time, who were beginning to take over survey, asked me to join them in cardiology, which I did, and then a year or two they bugged out and said, well, if they, if take you, go, this is yours. <laughs> you take over. <laughs> and I did that a couple of years, and then Dave Blankenhorn joined me, and then finally Dave took George Griffith's place as head of the, of the section, and by that time I was getting into a few other things, and so um, Dave and I uh, had a good time together. I was kind of touched. Uh, he died of cancer of the prostate a few years ago, and um, he called me and said how much he looked back and enjoyed those days that we taught together. So that was a reward, uh, reward for well, me. Well, when you well. got to work with Dr. George Griffith, he was a cardiologist. A real cardiologist. Renown, wasn't he? Yes. He was internationally known. Uh, he uh, was certainly a, yeah, probably the major consultant in cardiology in, uh, in uh, Southern California, and was a wonderful teacher, a warm hearted, loving man that uh, that tried to do the best for his uh, his students and his patients. So when did you start organizing courses? I'm sure you did that before you became uh, uh, in charge of continuing medical education. No, no, no I, it, it, that, 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 that is that that's that was continuing education okay. of the courses, okay. right? Um, well, this the I've been there 12 months, and I get a I get a. Uh, phone call from uh, Gordon Goodhart, Phil, would you come up and uh, I, I want to talk to you. Which he was the dean then. He was dean, yes. And um, he said, uh, Bob Clellan, our pathologist, our, uh, is going to take, he is a pathologist, he's going to take a full-time job in pathology at Children's Hospital. Would you like to take over what he was doing in continuing medical education? Well, yeah. He said, I can also, I can also increase your salary by, I think it was, Twenty-five hundred or three thousand dollars more, but I'd have been—is that per month or per year? No, no, that was a year. <laughs> oh boy! And uh, so he, um, but I would have been glad to pay him because it seemed to me then I got sort of revved up on this that this was a pretty exciting opportunity to try to help physicians learn if, after they graduated. So yeah, I was really happy to do that. And that was in fifty-five or six. That was fifty-five. Fifty-five. Yeah. Now, when did you start organizing classes well, that, that went elsewhere? Oh, I mean, uh, some of the travel courses. Yeah. Well, we, you know, we did a, before that, we did some courses in the county hospital that were pretty good. We called bedside clinics mm -hmm. where people like Pete Reynolds and other, uh, other uh, of our, our good faculty would take a group on Tuesday nights and make ward rounds with them on patients that they had picked out but, and would have a lesson. The second hour was... Uh, when they uh, would, would sit in a room with about 40 or 50 people and present two or three cases. We thought that was pretty good. And then I worked on a course with, uh, with Leonard Swartz and uh, Irv Hoffman, who was, uh, Irv was the uh, was chief of uh, electrocardiography. Leonard Schwartz, that's a, uh, what was his specialty? Leonard was a, 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 a you, he, would, he was a good ward instructor. He was a good general person. And tragically, he was wounded in the war, got blood transfusion, and had hepatitis B that ultimately did him in. You probably oh. had him on the wards. Yeah, well, I great remember. guy, great mm -hmm. guy. Well, he and Irv and I put together uh, two 52 week correspondence courses in uh, electrocardiography. And um, it, it was went over like gangbusters, and uh, I learned uh, later that the university netted something like 175,000 on it, and that they put it into one of our buildings down there. And, and 175 in those days was was more money. Oh yes. Now, when but did you start uh, going to other countries and on cruise ships? Well, we didn't do so much cruise ships, but we did start to travel. And the, the, what happened, I think on about the second course that, that I, I gave, and I did it with George Griffith's help, um, after the course, which went over pretty well, after the course, uh, a Dr. Cunningham, if I remember right, from Visalia came in, and Dr. Griffith had introduced me as the person that was going to do this, uh, this job in continuing education. So he says, uh, he, he clasped my hand and he said, Dr. Manning, I wish you well in your new, uh, your new job here, but he said, you know, the truth is, that we doctors that are in rural areas have trouble getting coverage. And so we can't get out uh, to programs very much. Is there something you can do about that? And um, it occurred to me that maybe we could have programs in a, 
setting, in a vacation setting, the physician could bring their family. We would work them from 7 to 12 and have another, hour, usually an hour at night, but they'd have all afternoon and all evening for recreation and, and with their family. So it really started, and we did that in Hawaii. Uh, and incidentally, the 50th anniversary of one of our early courses there is uh, next week. So the, they, oh they, they will, uh, they will uh, So they have their that. vacation and continuing medical well, education? Well, that was the idea. What we tried to do was to develop sort of a club-like atmosphere. Yeah. And uh, I, as I say, the fact that it still exists, I think, uh, is worthwhile. Are uh, they still doing it? Uh, uh, well, we do still? about three a year now, I think, uh -huh. yeah. And then from that, the foreign travels started. Uh, I began to invite uh, individuals uh, uh, from other countries uh, to supplement our good faculty. And uh, they, after they came over and did their participation, we had some really good people. And uh, they um, said, you know, why don't you bring a group over to our, our hospital? And so we began to do that. And we ended up going to 53 countries, I think, both in Western, Eastern Europe, and in uh, 53? Not, uh, not 53 courses, but sometimes right. it would be three or four courses, three or four countries. In that different countries. Trip. Yes, 53 different countries. The one in, uh, in Russia was the, I think we had the, from what I was told, we had the first medical group to get into Russia. This was in the Khrushchev days. And we were having a little trouble getting, getting things started uh, through the end tourists and the representatives over here. So I wrote a note to the chairman and told him what I wanted to do and, and could he make suggestions how to do it. About two weeks later, I get a phone call and said, Let's go to from work. From Khrushchev? Not from Khrushchev. No, that would have been something. But no, it was from one of the one of the travel people in the, in the, in the United States, and uh, so it worked out, and it worked well. So he must have given his blessing. Well, he or his secretary. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, what are your current views now on the continuing education? I know now that you've retired from it, but you never quite get out of it. Your mind is still with it. Well, it certainly is. The um, you, you know, when I, I, I started all this, I thought courses were a living end. And then it became pretty clear that the courses would, would help a doctor become uh, aware of what the current state of the art was, but probably wouldn't necessarily help the physician uh, uh, mm -hmm. practice a lot better, uh, learn certain things. So uh, over the years, uh, I developed, uh, and I think I'm maybe one of the first in the business to talk about practice-linked education, to try to, to try to link the education right to the practice arena. And this is what I feel is the most important. Now, the concept is not new. Osler said this in 1902 or so, and I think, and I'll paraphrase him, he said, the physician should start his education with a patient, continue with a patient, and end with a patient using textbooks uh, to supplement. And so with that general concept, and, and other people have, have said somewhat similar things, um, most doctors were not able to do the things that Osler thought should be done, but technology is making it possible now. Mm -hmm. And so right at the moment, if you ask me what I think CME ought to be, I think the, the doctor, it ought to be practice link to begin with. I think the doctor should um, have a database so they know pretty much what they've been doing, what the results have been. I think they, there needs to be and so actually some of the work that was done in our place, uh, Dr. Covell and I and some others, uh, decided that, uh, or, or did a little experiment that showed that, that uh, physicians it really uh, had a problem and a question of what should be done right while they were seeing patients. So we published this little paper, and uh, all of a sudden people began to develop uh, quick answers to, sh to specific questions, and there's two or three of those now. Up to date is a pretty good one. Uh, American College Cardiology came out with Peer. S some people like Scolar. There's a, there's a number of others where they're not quite right yet, but they're getting awful close. And then the the third part of this four part thing is to have a reminder system again electronic, where the physician to, to help avoid uh, errors of omission. And finally, I think sociability is so important in education. Doctors ought to have the opportunity of meeting with peers and discussing the practical problems that come up in their, in their practices. When uh, along the line did you start associating in, in practice-based education? When did you start 
working with pregnant women and the uh, uh, internal medicine problem associated. Yeah, with that was quite a while ago, and I can't remember the year on that, but Gail Anderson, who was a chief of, uh, of obstetrics at that time, uh, and I were talking, and he said, you know, we've got an awful lot of uh, patients with medical problems over there, hypertension and heart trouble and all. And he had just started with, with um, Bob Tranquata uh, at the advice of uh, Helen Martin to have a, uh, a clinic for pregnant women that were diabetic. So Gail and I thought, well, why not do something in, in general medicine, and predominantly cardiology, uh, but it, it kind of grew into uh, many other things, the endocrinology, seizures, and all this. So and we applying it to the patient again. Uh. Well, uh, <laughs> that's right. Well, we so we had clinics uh, where we had you know maybe thirty-five patients a week, and the pregnant ladies. One problem with the county hospital, they often don't come back, but the, these pregnant ladies always came back. So we we could we could follow them, and we had a good experience. And I again About treasure. When was that? Pardon me? About when? I when? wish I could tell you about when, but in the 70s, probably. Uh -huh. Probably. I mean, I'm a little off on that, just when that might be. And uh, at that point, um, Jerry Andes, did you know Jerry? No. Yeah, he was, was an OB man. and uh, Gail Anderson. And he was of course, OB too, wasn't he? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Gail, uh, 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 Jerry was uh, came in and worked on the clinic. And then one of my best friends, George Messman, uh, joined. He came up from... Uh, from Argentina and as a fellow and came to the clinic and he's more or less taken that over now and uh, George is uh, again one of my best friends here. Well, that, that's great. Or I uh, should say Jorge but I uh, Jorge. still call him George. <laughs> now you've written a book on postgraduate education. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that and your well, co-author? I, I can, I can. Uh, I'd like to uh, say sort of how that happened. I did have an uh, opportunity to uh, to uh, to uh, be a, first a governor and a uh, regent and finally vice president of American College of Cardiology and then a, a chairman of a number of educational committees in American College of of Cardiology. The first was ACP American College of, Medi of uh, Medicine and uh, American College of Cardiology and then I got I was a fellow of the American College of uh, Medical Informatics and. Uh, uh, that gave me uh, great contacts to uh, get a better understanding of what's going on in practice and how some of the ideas that we thought theoretically might might work. I was on a study committee for the National Library of Medicine that, that issued grants for different kinds of projects, and I met uh, Dr. Lois DeBakey, who is uh, the sister of Mike, the uh, surgeon, and uh, she was and is a distinguished writer and she liked some of the ideas that I had when we talked informally. So we got together and tried to write a book. Uh, I think the first edition was in uh, 89. And that, that uh, we it had a secondary, a second edition. And the, the fundamental concept was what can a physician do to systematically benefit through experience better than they can do if it just randomly go to work in the at daytime. And then the second edition, we tried to uh, have a number of, of leading physicians write essays to try to recapture the soul of medicine, which we began to think maybe is beginning to s slip a little well, bit. These were all guest authors. They, that's, that, that is true. The, um, so that worked, worked well, and that, uh, I, th I think they were, were pretty successful. The first one, I understand, sold about 20,000. The second was probably not that, uh, not that good. One of the one of the events that uh, that came out of that was uh, I was invited to be a commencement speaker at the medical school at, uh, at Miami, so I was happy to, to go down there. And uh, one of the um, <laughs> one of the young ladies was driving me to one of the events, and she said, "Well, you know, you weren't first choice." I said, "No, I didn't." <laughs> I didn't know. She said, "We wanted Robin Williams, but we couldn't <laughs> we couldn't get him." So. <laughs> well, I, I'm afraid they uh, they didn't have nearly the uh, nearly the uh, entertainment Robin that Robin Williams Did you make would have. Them laugh? <laughs> 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 Tell me about some of the deans. I remember the first dean that our class had was Gordon Goodhart. Yes, well, Gordon hired me before Gordon was uh, was B. O. Ralston, who was there when uh, I was a, uh, a medical student, and I had a, a couple of uh, interesting experiences with him. First of all, he was a superior 
storyteller, absolutely superior. And USC, far west, you know, Boston people didn't really know a lot about SC. And he, when he was dean, he'd go to the dean's meeting, and SC became sort of the center stage because he was such a good storyteller. So <laughs> I, after that, everybody knew that SC was there, and this wonderful man, B.L. Ralston, was the dean. But in addition to that, I had a couple of occasions to talk to him to get letters of recommendation or something, and he had an intent abil intense ability to uh, uh, really concentrate on what you were talking about. He gave tremendous eye contact and was very, very much with it. And uh, he would, uh, you just felt that his whole life was devoted to helping you for this couple of minutes. You'd be in and out of the office in maybe three or four minutes, but it seemed like an eternity because he was, he was so intense. So I remember him very well. And uh, he, he was, as I say, he was our dean at that time as a medical student. When I, I was hired by uh, Gordon Goodhart, and the interim was, uh, Celie Mudd was an interim dean between that. Mm -hmm. He was, he made, uh, or his family made big money in copper, and he, he gave quite a little money to the school. In fact, he bought the, the land where our medical school campus is for $750,000, and when it was a vacant lot, which was essentially a slum area at that time. But, so, but he, he acted dean until they got to Gordon. Gordon Goodhart uh, had been in the service, uh, he was a good internist, was working in the county hospital, and at age 40, he uh, agreed to become dean. Now, uh, he told me, and I can't remember just the circumstance, but he said, you know, I'm going to be dean for whatever it was, three or four years, and then I'm going to take a residency in psychiatry, and then I'm going to do that for 20 years, and then I'm going to become a sculptor. And he did everything, everything like that. Boom, boom, boom. He was, he was dean. First of all, he was a good internist, and a good military service. He was dean, psychiatrist, sculptor. Is he still sculpturing? Uh, you know, I talked to him about three years ago on the phone. I haven't talked to him since. He's a, his voice sounds a little weak now, but uh, oh. he, he seemed okay then. Good for him. That was a remarkable thing. So who came after Dr. Goodhart? Uh, Dr. Goodhart. Um, we had, uh, oh, well, you know, we had an interim group with Tom Brem and Pete Lee that, um, that looked after the dean's office. Uh, Tom did not want to be called acting dean or dean, but they called him chairman of the faculty executive committee, and his right-hand man was Pete Lee. Pete Lee and Tom Brem essentially ran the medical school for, uh, for several years and did a good job, actually. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, Pete was, you know, very academically oriented and was looking. And he came in then, Dr. He, Lee. Uh, uh, Dr. Lee came in, uh, I think, about six months after I did, and I always call him the new kid on the block. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he and I, of course, he's one of my best friends as well. He, um, at any rate, they ran the school well. Then Clayton Loosely came out from Chicago. Mm -hmm. He was an expert in histoplasmosis and uh, became dean. Uh, and he tend to bring, he brought a certain academic aura with him. Uh, he did have a, a, a failing. Uh, he had a, a pretty sharp temper, and it would, it would kind of blow up, in my view, inappropriately. Now, unfortunately, I didn't have much of a run-in, but I always was a little bit uncomfortable wondering was, was something going to happen. Truth is, he treated me magnificently, but uh, I was always a little bit cautious that, that, that something's going to happen here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, uh, then Roger Egerberg came in, mm -hmm. and uh, of course Roger had been the uh, the physician for uh, General MacArthur uh, during World War II, uh, and uh, was was uh, chief of the of the county system. So he knew he knew things pretty well, and he had Franz Bauer was was his chief uh, assistant at that time uh, at at the county, and then he came over in medicine and brought Franz uh, along with him. And uh, they called, call him Jolly Roger, as you know, so many stories about him. But one of the, um, well, I have a hundred and one anecdotes, but one of the ones that if you're ever at a party with, with Roger, sort of uh, toward the middle of the party, he was likely to get up on a table and sing the Norwegian nat national anthem. <laughs> uh, one time we were, we were waiting in a restaurant to get in, and it was a fairly long line, and Roger didn't, that was one of the two or three things he didn't like. Um, so he... Um, he, and this is a big man, you know, he was, he was uh, 
probably 250 pounds and about 6'3 or 4. And so he'd just lay out flat on, <laughs> on, the, on the ground next to the line, and people all sort of come struggling in. And he said, get me a table. <laughs> and so we got a, we got a quick table. He, uh, <laughs> so he, um, he was fun to work with and I think was quite effective. Most of the faculty thought he was a powerful man. I think most of the faculty thought he could have used his power to, be, to, to do still more. But he, I think he did very well. And then when in he- In promoting USC, you mean? In promoting the medical school. There's always, this, there's always this tension between the university campus who wants us to do more with less money, and we want to do more with the more money that we need. And there's always a question of who's, who's right on that. But then uh, Franz Bauer took the job, and Franz, of course, was a, another great storyteller and a great, warm, friendly man who was very, uh, I think, did an excellent job. There's an anecdote about his dad that I'd like to mention. His dad was, was uh, uh, Julius uh, uh, Bauer, who uh, was in the before World War I, and I guess a little bit after that, was really the, uh, the, the, the doctor of, the, uh, of Europe and, and the, the, the fading kings and queens and princesses always wanted Julius to, to work with them when they got sick. So he was a major consultant. And uh, to make a long story short, he was Jewish, of course, and uh, to make a long story short, he was Heinrich Himmler's doctor. And this, this, this was interesting. And one day, according to Fred, uh, who was, uh, was Franz's uh, brother, uh, he, he gets a note from, from Heinrich Himmler saying, I'm not sure I can support you much longer. It would be advisable to leave the country. Well, Marianne, who was, was uh, Franz's mother. Now this is just prior to World War II. This would have been prior to World War II. Yes, yes. yeah, probably, I guess, around, what, maybe 37, sure. probably something like that. And uh, so they, he had a friend in Paris who arranged for an airplane with Polish insignias to land about 10 or 15 minutes before the scheduled plane from Poland would come in. So Marianne and Julius got in, got in the plane, flew off to Paris. The next day, Fred and, and Franz got in an airplane. They weren't under quite the scrutiny, apparently, and were able to, uh, to escape. So it was, it was a a tense moment there for for sure but uh, Franz went to LSU and uh, then uh, was was a uh, senior resident at the county hospital along with he and Pete Reynolds he had the Loma Linda service and Pete had the uh, SC service and they were both uh, both outstanding clinicians uh, as well as uh, Franz turned into be an outstanding Dean I think he should get significant credit for the uh, for the University Hospital he and, uh, and uh, Mr. Emer had lunch, apparently. I've heard at different places. Uh, I thought it was at, uh, well, it doesn't matter where, but at any rate. And uh, the, the issue came up, how about a, uh, how about a, uh, a hospital? Now, this uh, is, was a sore, sore point with, uh, with Dr. Topping. And, uh, he was president of the he was. Uh, big university. He was big, big man. Uh, uh, he, he, was, uh, he was terrific. Uh, there's some stories about him, actually, I'd like to tell. Um, he, um, uh, there's several of us went, and I think this was even before Franz and, and Emer got together, but went down to uh, the uh, office to meet with, uh, with uh, President Topping and had all, all prepared what we were going to say, why we needed a university hospital. And he listened. He's a bit of a smoker, and he listened and was smoking away. Didn't say much, but seemed to be listening. And everybody said we need it for this reason or that reason. And then he, after we sort of ran out of breath, he said, well, he said, yeah, yeah, you're going to get a community hospital over my dead body. <laughs> he, <laughs> he, oh he had come from the uh, University of Pennsylvania that had all sorts of budgetary problems with the, uh, the community, uh, with the uh, university hospital. Now, later on, when he realized NME was going to take the, the brunt of the, uh, of the building, <clears throat> he changed his mind. <clears throat> and thought it would be a good idea. NME, what was uh, NME, National oh, Medical Enterprises, okay. which was the, pr the, the name that a tenant started with. Uh, okay. And Mr. Emer was one of the, one of the people that, uh, that started that. So uh, that, um, that was uh, one other little thing about Norman Topping. Um, Tom Brem once wrote, uh, uh, first of all, I don't know whether you remember this or not, but uh, 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 
Kaiser Permanente. Was, gonna, was, was actually started by two US, uh, USC Service County Hospital people, Sid Garfield and Maury uh, Cullen, and they, uh, they, were the, they were the brains behind this. So, so there was a link, and Tom was resident, I think, with, with Sid at that time. And in any event, the California Medical Association, for reasons known only to them, said that any doctor that practices with, uh, with Kaiser Permanente are irregular practitioners. You, uh, you remember that? It was I in do. the papers at the time. They and Tom, down on Tom, I Tom wrote a wrote a, uh, uh, a piece that was published in the Times and said this is nonsense and they're they're doing a good job and so on and so forth. And two or three of our trustees, and I don't remember the ones, uh, said, "Well, we got to fire this guy, Brem. Who? What's he? What's he doing? He's going against uh, organized medicine or whatever else." And uh, Sam Rappaport, who was a great uh, great hematologist and two or three other people went down to Topping's office. And from what I, I just talking to Sam about this the other day. And uh, they go, come in the office and as they often did, uh, Dr. Topping uh, didn't look up, he was, was whatever he was doing, kept him standing there at, the, at his desk for about uh, five minutes. And then they gave the story why Tom Brem was a great professor, which he was, and why this was nonsense and Topping didn't say a word, said, okay, thanks for coming down. Uh, then Paul Saunders, did you have him in, yes. in pharmacology? Yes. Well, he somehow was at, at, the, uh, at the California Club when the, uh, with, with whoever was dean at that point, and uh, he um, heard the argument that trustees would get up and say, we've got to let this guy Brem go. You know, he can't be, he's, <laughs> whatever, he's a revolutionary or whatever they thought. And again, Topping sat back there with a cigarette, according, this is all according to Paul Saunders, and didn't say a word. And then they ran out of breath finally. <laughs> and so he, he, he sort of handled them a little bit like he handled us. He says, well, he says, gentlemen, we, we could let Dr. Brem go and become the laughing stock of academia. And the meeting broke up, and that was the end of that. And he stayed. <laughs> <laughs> he stayed and were, had a distinguished career, right? right. Yeah. So now we're we talking deans or, or professors. Well, no, we're talking. Well, we're still talking deans. Deans. Just to well, then, kind of the, well, then, uh, the uh, uh, Dr. Matthias uh, came in. It replaced uh, uh, Julius. Not Julius. No, it was Franz. Franz oh, was yeah. the son. Okay. Julius. I gave that little story about. Sure. And um, uh, Dr. Matthias had been a. Uh, had had worked. He was a fine pediatrician in infectious disease, especially, and he um, did a uh, did a really good job, I think, because he knew he knew budgets almost better than anybody else, and so I think he had the school going uh, in in excellent uh, excellent fashion. After um, after uh, Matthias, it seems to me that uh, and he oh he went on and had a distinguished career as uh, president of Huntington Hospital. So he's still around, still, still very active, still a very good guy. Um, then there was a, an interim while they were looking for a dean that Joe Vandermeulen took over. And Joe did this on two occasions between deans. And uh, again, he understood budgets. He was, he had a... Was he, he an internist? He was, a, no, an outstanding neurologist. He was, and I was, I was always sort of sorry to see him go into administration because he was such a, uh, such a great uh, neurologist. But um, he did a... Excellent job as dean, and later, and later he was, or maybe at about the same time, he was vice president of health affairs, and they moved him around to where he did our hospital relations, mm -hmm. and um, he, and I think, really a cultured guy, and I think he gave the school a very good image in the in the in the, in the various hospitals, and then we're fortunate enough to land Bob Tranquata, who had been uh, on the, um, again worked his way through the county system, worked under under. Uh, uh, UCLA Dean uh, uh, Melenkoff, who was uh, in some ways the, the Dean of Deans. He was an uh, outstanding uh, Dean at UCLA, mm -hmm. and then went back and became Dean at, uh, at Massachusetts. So he had all the, uh, all the credentials, came out here, and he, and he had been involved in getting uh, the Watts Clinic started and was very interested in the delivery of health care. Came out and again had another uh, several excellent years uh, as, as, as the, um, the dean. And then finally, um, uh, Steve Ryan comes in. And Steve uh, negotiated where he was the 
senior vice president and the dean, so he had quite a lot of clout. What year was that? I don't know exactly, but let's say this, he was dean for nine or 10 years, so this must have been, a, must have been 12, 13 years ago, something like that, uh, when, he, when he ended. Uh, no, when he start, when he would have started, started, that would yeah. have been about right. So he uh, had lofty ideas and, uh, and ideals and really worked hard to try to get our school up to uh, somewhere in the first 10 for whatever reason. And uh, Academically speaking. Academically speaking, and, and uh, the, the index was going to be what, how many NIH grants you got. And uh, he <coughs> ultimately, as I guess many of our deans do, got into conflict with the administration. He thought we needed more resources, which if any of the administration is listening, we do need more, <laughs> we do need more resources. <coughs> and um, so we then, uh, then have an interim dean now, uh, uh, Brian Henderson, who again has a, done a really good job. So mostly, we've had, all, all together, I think we've had very good deans. And from a personal standpoint, I've had good backing, good support from all of the deans, everyone. Oh, that's wonderful. If you had to choose uh, some of your best memories, you've given us a, a real <coughs> overview now, but what is your favorite time? Or what, uh, what about the, your time at SC that would stand out in your memory that well, you know, give you the most, the there, most there, good there, I, I've, I've been fortunate to have, have been able to uh, participate in a number of, uh, of different activities. Certainly, as we talked about, the ward instructor physical diagnosis, survey of disease, and uh, we started, uh, oh, I should, should have mentioned the, the doctor-patient relation that we, that we started. Mm -hmm. That started, I think, about 1958. Uh, and it, it, uh, it started um, in a conversation between Tom Brem and Ed Steinbrook, who was the professor of uh, psychiatry, psychiatry yeah. exactly. And uh, it was a party, I think it was at Irv Gordon's house, and they got to talking over in the corner, and they were saying that, uh, from what they tell me, that our medical students come in with better interpersonal skills and they leave because they get so filled up with all this listening to this and looking at that that they, um, th that they forget that this is a person on the other side. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could do something about that? And uh, so at that point, Tom beckoned me to come over. This is at a party, and I think I had a beer in my hand. And he said, um, Ed and I want to organize a program uh, that will enhance the student's ability to, uh, to deal with a doctor-patient relation. And would you be interested in, in representing medicine for that? And I said, oh, absolutely. And, and Ed appointed uh, Seymour Pollock to represent him. And Ed had previously gotten three years, or three hours in the, um, in the first year from the, uh, com from the uh, curriculum committee. So he said, why don't we just use that? That, that we've got three hours, and so, C so Seymour and I had a no more than a half hour meeting, and decided what we'd do would have we would have uh, the students uh, see a patient at, at, at that time in the county hospital, and uh, then we would would bring the student back in groups of five to sit down with a psychiatrist and an internist or another non psychiatric doctor and talk about their experiences. How, how were they able to create a, uh, an atmosphere where the patient felt free to talk? Um, and Tom Brem wanted to make sure that we looked at uh, where a patient may say one thing and mean another. And uh, what, maybe more importantly, what the student was feeling at the time and how they reacted to the patient. So they, they began to discuss that in these, these small groups. And then after that, as we were trying to learn, the faculty got together and had a meeting for the, for the third hour as to what, what went on. So that was fun, and I met, uh, met a number of people uh, uh, there. How, when was that one, uh, that uh, whole? That started in 1958. 58, okay. Yeah, that started in 1958. The, um, so I had ch a chance to do that, and uh, then, then the, the dealing with the pregnant uh, ladies with, with heart disease, fundamentally, and of course running the continuing education. And if you ask the question, what do I look back at age 86 as the most satisfying, which I think what your question was, till I went on this random, uh, random approach. What we want to hear. Um, the, uh, I think ward instructor and working in the, uh, in the uh, clinic, in the OB clinic with patients with, with various heart disease. And again, 
the other part was me meeting and, and being with so many really great people. Pete Lee we've talked about, uh, uh, Telfer Reynolds who was a tiger, you knew him for, certainly. We called him Black Pete. Black Pete, <laughs> he was a wild bull of the pampas, would be down to the hospital all the time. Helen Martin stands Wonderful. out, you never can, never can beat that. Uh, C.J. Byrne, Tom Byrne's our current surgeon. Uh, Tom, uh, C.J. Byrne was uh, his was, father. A, was his father and was outstanding. And he and Helen, I think, really, and t of course Tom, Bre uh, Tom Brem as well, were really the conscience of medicine in the county hospital because every one of them said, by God, you're going to take good care of those patients. There's no, there's no middle ground here. You're going to do the very best you can. Sam Rappaport was our hematologist and, and some of the, uh, gosh, I'm missing so many good guys. Saul Bernstein was, uh, came on and uh, then became, worked into, uh, Saul was about a year ahead of you, I think, or maybe right I about think that. He was yeah, then he two, became yeah. chief of, at the county hospital. Um, Jack Bethune took over from uh, Tom Brem when, uh, when, um, when Tom quit, and he had a great idea. He, he had a student ward that, uh, where the students were fundamentally interns working carefully under a, uh, a senior resident and an attending person would come in uh, three or four times a week and, and go over the thing. So I thought Jack, and unfortunately that somehow financially I guess they couldn't continue it, but uh, it, that was, was great. So I'd say three things, the, the, the associations I met and there are many others I've left out, I'm sorry, and then the ward instructor and, uh, and working with, uh, with Jerry Andes uh, and uh, George Messman, especially in the, and of course Gail Anderson in that clinic. Well, you've certainly emphasized what my class learned. The USC is one of the greatest clinical schools of medicine that uh, that we could know, and of course many of us in my class have had a chance of comparing uh, what we learned and what we were exposed to to other medical schools, and I, I wouldn't trade my experience here for anything. Nor would I. I, <laughs> I. I wouldn't do it. Thank you for all that you have done for us and, and for me and for the USC School of Medicine. Well, it's a pleasure. To, an old man likes to reminisce and I <laughs> like to reminisce. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.